just as the heavenly bodies always repeat a certain movement once they have been flung into it, so also does social production once it has been flung into this movement of alternate expansion and contraction. Effects become causes in their turn, and the various vicissitudes of the whole process, which always reproduces its own conditions, takes on the form of periodicity. As we saw in the previous section, as capital accumulates, it produces a larger and larger population of unemployed workers. However, as we also previously discussed, its growth fluctuates and changes depending on what capitalism's needs and requirements are. Its nature is elastic. So as it grows, sometimes slowly, sometimes rapidly, it produces more and more new means of production. New technologies, new infrastructure, new production and sources of raw materials, etc. What this means is that capitalism must also constantly pull back in workers it had previously thrown out to work upon those new means of production and new areas of accumulation. At the start of the previous chapter, we established that capitalism must reproduce not only the means of production every cycle, but the labour power as well. And here now we see how it does that, by constantly throwing people out of work, creating a larger and larger population of unemployed workers, or a reserve supply of future labour, and then pulling some back in, when and as it needs them. What we see then is that unemployment is entirely dependent on the accumulation and needs of capitalism. It is not caused by any crisis, but is fundamentally built into the system itself. Quite simply, if there's no jobs, there's no work. This means that the working class produces not only the growth or accumulation of capital, but also produce the means for their own growing unemployment. Marx refers to this as capitalism's law of population. The unemployment is not only a product or end result of capitalism, but it is also its own means to continue to reproduce itself. We can also see a little more clearly here what Marx was referring to in the previous chapter regarding the consumption of all capital produced. The consumption, whether of the means of production in the labour process or of the commodities for the reproduction of labour power, is actually only being done by those labourers that are employed. Society's social wealth is growing and accumulating, but this wealth and the consuming of it are actually separated from the unemployed labourers that accumulation creates, who are pushed into the reserve supply of future labour. We have further seen that the capitalist buys with the same capital a greater mass of labour power as he progressively replaces skilled labourers by less skilled, mature labour power by immature, male by female, that of adults by that of young persons or children. Here we also see how the total social variable capital, or the total of society's surplus value spent on labour power, functions. It becomes the supply of value that is used as wages and distributed to various sections of the unemployed workers to pull them back in to the labour process. This is distributed in different amounts and to different sections of the unemployed workers depending on the type of labour power that is required, e.g. whether it's skilled labour, low quantity of high wages, or a large amount of unskilled labour, high quantity of low wages. We see then that the movement and changes in wages is entirely dependent on capitalism's demand of labour, not its supply. It forms a disposable industrial reserve army that belongs to capital, quite as absolutely as if the latter had bred it at its own cost. Independently of the limits of the actual increase of population, it creates, for the changing needs of the self-expansion of capital, a mass of human material, always ready for exploitation. Another important point that Marx makes here is that the unemployed population act as another mechanism of capitalism to regulate itself. We saw earlier in the book 
that capitalism forces extensions to the length of the working day to increase productivity and intensity, and also the tendency to force down the price of the wage. The pressure from the mass of the unemployed workers on the waged workers allows capitalism to achieve these things, as any workers that don't work as long, as intensely or as cheaply, soon find themselves fired and replaced by those who are unemployed. Marx refers to this ever-growing mass of unemployed workers as the Industrial Reserve Army. The relative surplus population exists in every possible form. Every labourer belongs to it during the time when he is only partially employed or wholly unemployed. Marx now turns his attention and analysis to the unemployed mass of workers, or the supply of future labour, which he calls the Industrial Reserve Army, and breaks down this mass into three main forms. The first is the floating population. This is the reserve supply that have been thrown in and out of work around centres of large-scale industry and production. Usually, it is made up of slightly older age group of the population, as these industries tend to favour younger workers and expel the older ones. However, Marx notes that these industries also tend to be bad for people's health and often shortens the people's lives who work in them. Marx notes that this form generally follows or floats around centres of industries and new areas of production in their search for work. In today's world, the floating population is usually seen as those that are currently not employed but who are looking for work. The second is the latent population. This is the population that is removed from farming work or their land by both force and as capitalism revolutionises its agricultural production with technology. As the restructuring of agriculture usually requires very little labourers, we see a steady stream of the rural population constantly moving towards towns and cities in the search for work. As we'll see more over the next few chapters, this population, due to their relationship to their lands and more communal ways of life, have often proved a struggle for capitalism to turn into wage labourers and usually required extreme violence and force to do so. The last is the stagnant population. This population is made up of a few other groups, largely those that are permanently unemployed or those that are skilled in only very specific roles that are needed very infrequently. Marx notes that if people from this population are ever used as labour power, it is usually the lowest paid and longest hours possible. Also included in this population is the lumpen proletariat. The beggars, criminals, prostitutes and those that try to survive and find other methods of earning money at the fringes of poverty. And lastly, also included in this population is pauperism, those who are in complete poverty and permanently unemployed due to sickness, ill health and injuries. This is essentially the very bottom, where those who are out of work long enough will eventually fall too. As capital accumulates and grows, so does the social wealth it produces. However, as the social wealth grows, it also produces a larger and larger supply of unemployed workers without access to that social wealth. As the number of unemployed workers grows and grows, so does complete poverty and pauperism. In this final section, which I recommend you read for yourself, 
Marx highlights many, many official government reports and official statistics that document everything discussed throughout this chapter. From statistics on rising social wealth, employment and unemployment figures, and to the massive rise of poverty and misery throughout England and Ireland. Within the capitalist system, all methods for raising the social productivity of labour are put into effect at the cost of the individual worker. That all means for the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion, so that they become means of domination and exploitation of the producers. They degrade him to the level of an appendage of a machine. They destroy the actual content of his labour by turning it into a torment. They alienate him from the intellectual potentialities of the labour process in the same proportion as science is incorporated in it. It follows, therefore, that in proportion as capital accumulates, the situation of the worker, be his payment high or low, must grow worse.